Amen. Well, uh, let's go this morning. I'd like to pick up on part two of uh, last week. Uh, last week we asked the question, how high can you go? How high can you go? Um, what is it that um, you want to accomplish in life? Where do you want to go? Uh, and we talked last week about your potential is directly related to your source. The animal's source is the ground. Right? The fish's source is the water. The bird's source is the air. Our source is our God. Our source is limitless. Limitless. That means you have unlimited potential. Everyone sitting in this room has the potential to be a genius. You never heard that before, did you? Nobody ever told you that. You're a genius, man. Without saying it derogatory, you are a genius. Because, see, if we look at Einstein, Einstein was a failure. They flunked him out of school. Now we teach him in school as the authority. Okay? He didn't fit the mold, but he was a genius. Now, we all have the potential to be the same thing. We talked about hair color last week. And now we talked about Frank. We asked him if he was bald. We were going to ask hair color, but we couldn't confirm or deny what his hair color was because we both have this issue. But was sure of the fact that he's bald. But then I turned around and asked the question, Pastor Frank, are you a genius? And there was a pause. That pause is what we refer to as a lack of confidence, a lack of self-esteem, a thing of not seeing ourselves the way God sees us. God sees you as limitless potential. Unlimited. There is nothing that you can't do. The scripture tells us all things are possible. Right? All things are possible. And I have done everything I could out to check that out. And all means exactly that. I've looked at Greek, Hebrew, Latin. It means all of it. Every bit of it. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. The thing that makes something impossible is the seed of doubt that we have in ourselves. We looked at the first sin. The first sin, when, when, when the enemy came to Eve, it was just a plan, a simple, a simple seed of doubt. Did God really say that? When he looked at Jesus and tempted Jesus 40 days into the wilderness, what did he say to him? If you are, if you're really the Son of God. The word that God just gave him just a few weeks earlier, right? Because the, the heavens opened up, a booming voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So what did the enemy test? Was he congruent? Did his heart truly believe what God said about him? So in this process that I'm beginning to to work on in my own life and I'm beginning to understand is, is I'm beginning to understand that my confidence in God is important. It's where everything starts. Because at, at, a lot of times uh, we want to look at it and we want to say, well, you've got to be careful about your confidence, you've got to be careful about your self-esteem because it becomes pride. Let's give a definition to pride. Okay? Pride by definition means unteachable. It has nothing to do with your self-esteem. Now, self-esteem misplaced becomes arrogance. Arrogance is being unteachable. It means I know everything about everything, so you can't teach me anything about that. That point, it becomes pride. And the Word of God says Jesus does what to the proud? Resist them or stands afar off. I don't want God to resist me. If you're feeling resistance from God in your life in an area, maybe it's because you don't feel you're teachable there. I'm not willing to learn. I'm not willing to change. So the presence of God is resisting you there. It's like your prayers only get to here. 
Sometimes that's because of our teachability, our willingness to learn, our willingness to change, our willingness to move on. So this whole thing comes down to this. Proverbs chapter 23, uh, verse 7. The first part of verse 7 says this. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It doesn't say, for as a man is called by God, so is he. <clears throat> you are who you think you are. I'm going to let that catch up with you for a minute. You are who you think you are. I was talking to some, some young people this week, and they were getting ready to go into a football game. And when I was asking about the football game, they looked at me and said, we're going to get killed by 50. I didn't even need to go to the game. I didn't need to watch the game. I didn't need to do anything. You know why? Because they were going to get killed by 50. Why? Because they believed. What's the difference between winning teams and teams that don't win? The belief system. Because I'm telling you, we've had some schools in this county that had much more talented athletes that lost. Why did they lose? Well, we blame it on the coach. No, we're not going to blame it on the coach. that gets to play. It's a thought process and it's a belief system. Why do we have in this county, why has Bridgeport High School won three consecutive state championships in, in football? Is it because they're more talented than everybody else? Now, I've met those guys. Some of those guys can't walk and chew gum at the same time. I met them. I know these kids. You know what it is? They believe it. And, uh, and we always say they direct the cool it. They believe lock, stock, and barrel, they can't be beat. You can't beat us. Why can't we beat you? Because we're bridge poor. You can't beat us. That's all they say. All the time. All the time. You go to the little kids. We're winners. Why are we winners? Because we wear red and white. <laughs> It's a belief system that we start in young. If you are on that team and you say, we're going to get beat, the only beat that's going to take place is you out behind the locker room because you're bringing a negative connotation to the system. We believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're the best. And you know what? They produce it because they're congruent with it. They believe it with everything that's inside of them. I've watched this happen over and over again. I'm going to show it to you in the scriptures how it happens. But it comes down to this. It says, as you think, we'll, we'll paraphrase it a little bit, as you think, that's who you are. If you think you're defeated, you're beat. If you think you're a champion, you win. If you think you're victorious, you will be. It starts in the thought process. Every success or failure starts between your ears. It starts with a thought. It starts with an idea. You realize that 92% of people don't like their life? 92% of people. Now, <clears throat> these people are saying, I don't like my life. Let's go over to this. 97% of people are being, have been treated for some form of depression. Is it possible that it directly related to the 92% of people that don't like their life? They're moving forward and talking in negative forms all the time. And if we're negative all the time, guess what? You're going to get negativity. Oh, no, Pastor, that's not true. As a man thinks in his heart, in his mind, his will and emotions. That's what our heart is. So what you believe about yourself is what you're going to have. If I'm a failure, maybe it's because I think I am. So let's look at how this works. A good friend of mine, uh, Randy Landis, has just written a book. And that book hopefully will be out sometime in November. The title of this book, Mama Rose, is Freighter's Thicket. And just by its particular name. Everybody's like, hmm, what's that? Well, what this is, is it is a book about the thought model. And it's based off of renewing your mind. It's based off of the scripture that tells us to renew our mind through what? The Word of God. 
So what we have to do in this, in this is we have to understand what is a thought and how do they work. So this whole book is 375 pages long. It's a big book. He said, I don't think anybody will read it. I said, well, they read Moby Dick and it was garbage. Maybe they'll read this. It's good. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I never understood the book. Anyway, this is how our system works. The process works, Robert. First, you have a thought. Okay? Good or bad. That thought is going to produce an emotion. <coughs> that emotion is going to produce an action. That action is going to produce a result. Okay? This is how it works. Now, this is processed. Remember, we said that women can process 70,000 thoughts a day. Okay? So this happens quickly. A thought produces an emotion. An emotion produces an action. An action produces a result. Every time. So somewhere in the process, we have to get a hold of it and stop it to produce the action or the result that we want to have. You have the ability to control your thoughts. You have that ability. You can put a stop at any point, good or bad. How do we do that? The scripture says over in Philippians chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 8 through 9, it says, Finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learn and receive and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So that tells me I have a choice of what I'm going to think on, where I'm going to put my thought process. In that list, was there anything negative? So if God's telling me to think on these things, what He's telling me is, do not allow negative thought processes to pass through your brain. You know what a negative thought process is? A lot of us. You know what, how we define it? Worry. Fear. Fear. Doubt. What if? Being anxious. Because the Word of God says be anxious for nothing. Come on, God, why do you do this to me? He said, listen, I give you this ability. I give you the ability to think on what I said. To believe and be congruent with what I said. So if you want a change in your life, if you want something different in your life, you have to change something. What do you have to change? Your thoughts. When you change your thinking, you change what you believe about yourself. I told you um, a, a story, I don't know if you remember if it was last week or <coughs> excuse me, a little bit back when, but um, Melissa will remember this car. Remember my black New Yorker? Oh, that was my car. When I first bought that car, I was attending a church in, in Fairmont. And I felt guilty for owning the car. Because it was a nice car. Until I had to get hit in the parking lot. It wasn't a nice car anymore. <clears throat> but I got in trouble for parking. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole other story. So I've got this black New Yorker. And Dave, this was one, this car was so you couldn't hold the front end down. I mean, you stepped on this thing, it had the power. And the kids called it my mafia car. You know, I mean, it just, I was the godfather in this car. I look good in this car, you know, because it was big enough for a big guy to look good in it. You know, you see some guys get out of a Prius, and it just doesn't look right. You know, he's six foot four, 285 pounds, he gets out of a Prius. That's not right. But you can get out of a New Yorker. And everybody's like, big car, big man, it's good, you know. <coughs> But I struggled driving that vehicle because I thought people would look at me. I thought people would say, well, who does he think he is driving that fancy car? I struggled with it. This was my struggle between my ears. 
and, and I continued to fight with it. And I, I found out through the root of things was I didn't see myself as worthy of having nice things. I thought I always had to have hand-me-downs. Because you know what, growing up all through my life, Mama raised four of us by herself. Worked two, three jobs, went to night school. Everything I had through my life was a hand-me-down. Everything. That's not a bad thing. But I made it a bad thing because I found myself not worthy of new things. Of nice things. It wasn't a new car. It was a hand-me-down car. But when I bought it, it had 15,000 miles on it. So it might as well be a new. One owner. Ooh. Cruising, baby. Until I had to put tires on it. Oh, my God. That hurt. But I didn't see myself as worthy of that vehicle. And I, I, it, it brought something up about me. Did I really believe what God said about me? Because He says, no good thing will I withhold. Well, if He doesn't want to withhold that from me, why can't I have it? Does He or does He not say that He wants to give you the desires of your heart? He does. It's there. Now, does it have some requirements to it? Yes. Those requirements are we obey Him. We live according to the rules. When we do that, there is nothing that I can't have. And I'm worth it. Now everybody said, oh, wait a second, now he's prideful. No, it's not pride. I didn't say I know everything and I'm going to teach it all to you. I just said, I'm worth what God says I can have. I deserve it. Why do I deserve it? Because of God. Because I'm a child of the King. Understand this. I can do nothing to produce salvation. Right? Because it's not by works, lest any man should boast. My salvation is rooted in God. But then he starts to say after that, now you do these things. So it requires me to see myself correctly so I can produce the right emotion, so I can produce the right action. Is it making sense? Well, let's look at it in the Scriptures. Over in Matthew chapter 14. <coughs> Excuse me. Matthew chapter 14. This is the passage of Scripture where Jesus walking on the water out there and then Peter decides to walk on the water. And uh, as I was going through uh, my classes this weekend, Dr. Johnson began to talk about this story. And um, this, this particular class is called um, Leadership by Confidence, of all things. Leadership by Confidence. You can't lead if you're not confident. It's impossible. Because if you don't believe it, nobody else is going to believe it. So here's the process he began to talk about. Um, before I get into that process, he did a test with somebody. And one of these times we'll do it. But uh, you guys know what kinesiology is, the study of muscles. Uh, if you, know, you can look it up. Kinesiology is uh, our system is built off of, uh, and, and if, if our system is congruent, our muscles will actually resist and lock out and be strong. So what he did is he brought this guy up front, and he said, uh, I want you to think of, close your eyes, think of the best thing that's ever happened in your life. I want you to re-experience that. I want you to do it. And I want you to hold your arm out. And when he did it, he would literally hang on his arm. He couldn't push his arm down. He's locked. And he said, all right, now close your eyes. Now I want you to think of the worst experience that ever happened in your life. It was bad. It was terrible. He probably cried. And with two fingers, he was able to take his arm down. His physical was changed by his mental. Okay? And we'll do the test sometime. Um, the physical was changed by the mental. Because when he was thinking positive thoughts, he stood straight, his back was up. But when he began to think negative, what began to happen? He began to slow. He began to lose his focus. He began to, now all of a sudden he was weaker. So here's what happens 
Jesus is walking on the water over here in Matthew. And he's, he's walking along and sees the disciples, thinks it's a great thing. So Peter, of all things, has a thought. Right? What was his thought? If Jesus is doing it, I think I could too. Why not? Good thought. Positive thought. So he said, Jesus, if that's you, bid me come. Right? So Jesus says, come. One word. Come on. So from that one word, an emotion was produced. His emotion was excitement and energy. He was getting ready to do something that he had never done before. That no one had ever done before. So what action did it produce? He got out of the boat. And he walked on the water. The result was, he was the only disciple to ever walk on water. And it started from a good thought. Now in the process, he's walking on this water. What happened? Negative thought. Lost his faith. Lost his focus. The negative thought came this way. And it was just simple. This storm is big. Produced an emotion. What was the emotion? Yeah. Fear. The emotion produced an action. What was the action? Sink. He started to sink. Which produced a result. Jesus had a bailing out. In the exact same situation. And the only thing that changed in the situation was the thought process of Peter. I mean, look, think about that. You can read the story. Nothing else changed. The storm didn't change. Jesus didn't change. The only thing that changed was Peter's thought process. That was it. So what's this tell me? The miracle that I need in my life, does God want to give me this? Yeah. So what's the variable? There you go. Do you believe it? Oh, love you. If we get it so far into our spirit that that becomes our reaction to everything. Jesus said to Peter, get out of the boat and walk. Come. One word. No problem. Boom. There he went. And you know what? He walked. Don't quit in the middle of your miracle. Don't change your mind. God didn't change His. He said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're the best thing that ever happened to this world. Dr. Johnson was funny. He said, I put my picture on my books. Run back here and get me one of his books. The white one's laying right on my shelf. The, the, the book I'm reading right now, it's a daily devotion on confidence. It's called Hashtag Be Confident. <coughs> okay? And he's looking and he's on his book and people look at him all the time and says, why do you put your picture on the book? And he just simply said, because I couldn't find any better looking person to put on that. <laughs> I'm teaching on confidence. I'm teaching on confidence. This guy, five years prior to this, was broke. Began to pray. Said, God, what do I do? What do I need to do? And God said, your problem is confidence. So he says, okay, my problem is confidence. So what do I do about it? God says, simple, for the next five years, for one hour a day, you study on confidence. And he's become an authority. If you study one hour a day for five years, you'll have more knowledge than, you'll be in the top 2% of people in the world with the knowledge on that subject. He was on television, and in television, he made a comment. He was a national TV, first national television interview. He said in that interview, nobody knows more about confidence than I do. And then he inside, he went, ooh, that might not have been a good thing to say. Then he backed up and he said, but it's true. He said, I didn't say I was the most confident person in the world. But nobody knows more about the subject. So, 
This is the dude. This is Dr. Johnson. Dr. Keith, in these five years, went from busted to where they're paying him big money just to sit in the same room. He sits in front of presidents. He sits in front of kings. He sits in front of dignitaries. He sits in front of Fortune 5000 company owners. All of these things. So they ask him all the time. Every one of his books has his picture on it. He says, why? He says, because I'm America's number one confidence coach. Why would I put anything else on the cover? Jesus and God was congruent when he made you. God loved you and wanted you to so he said, I'm going to create you in my image. Now that's it's a little arrogant, isn't it? Now, he says, who better to create you after than me? And he breathed into you himself, right? That's what the scripture talks to us about. So when he breathed into you, everything that you need to be successful, to be healthy, to be wealthy, to be wise, to be all of those things, he gave you. Pastor Frank and I talk a lot of time about the scripture. It says he gave you the ability to gain wealth. <clears throat> we have the wrong concept of work. Work is a gift from God. <coughs> it's a gift from God. It is a place for you to unleash your potential. Your potential will unleash your blessing. Remember what we talked about last week? Right? Your potential, that potential, is directly going to control and relate to your future. So the one place that you have, so let's say this, all right? Mike's a computer guy. He teaches computer networking, computer repair, all this stuff. Okay? So in, 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 in Mike's plan, and what he should be doing is this. We should always have study time in the Scriptures, right? But Mike should also be dedicating an hour a day to his field. To his field. Why? So he would be the absolute best person, most knowledgeable person on this subject of computer networking or whichever one it happens to be, because that computer world's about this big. It's a thousand different ways you can go. Alex is a concrete man. Okay? Some of the stuff he's built, you see some of the pictures and stuff he does? Crazy. He uses terms, I'm like, Whoa. okay? Now, the next great thing in construction could be in his hands. The next great invention could be in his hands. Because you know what? When we started concrete work way back in the, in the 30s and 40s and all that, the concrete would break and shatter. Now you've got pressure and you've got, you've got all this stuff in it and you've got all the... They, it goes crazy, crazy. Cure rates are different, all this stuff. It came from somebody. Who did it come from? Most of the time, somebody that was working in the field. They saw a problem, they fixed it. So the choice Alex has is this. I can go to work every day, and I can be a good worker. And I can stop there. And I'll eat out of living. I'll raise a family, and one day, if I'm fortunate enough, I'll retire. If not, maybe the social security system will still be around, and it'll take care of me. Maybe. Or, I can decide to be a great worker. What's the difference between the two? It could be as little as an hour a day. Because great people are willing to do what good people are not. Say that again. Great people are willing to do what good people are not. We're all the same. We say it with, what's the difference between us? Some are willing to pay the price. Some are not. Some make good decisions. Others don't. My uncle used to say all the time, I'm one bad decision away from prison. 
And you would say, but you're, look at you, you're a good man. You've got a good family, you got this, you got this. He said, I'm always one bad decision away from it. Because somebody just messed with my family or something, I took a gun out and shot him in the head. Bad decision. I'm in prison. Doesn't matter. All the good I did before. I'm one bad decision away from it. If that's true, could it also be true that I'm one good decision away from greatness? Ooh. Let that one sink into you. I am one good decision away from greatness. Just one decision. So in my life right now, the challenge they put out to, the, to us was, I'm in the process of writing a five-year plan for my personal life. All right? And, and my goal is to have it written and implemented by the end of October. Okay? Okay? That's quick. All right? But here's the trick. You can buy any map. You can have any GPS system. But it will tell you nothing unless you know where you are. Right? When you go to Google Maps or one of those, it says, I want to go to San Diego, California. The first question it asks is, where are you? Because if you don't know where you are, there's no way to get directions to where you want to go. Right? Seems very elementary, doesn't it? But we skip this part. We don't want to admit where we are. We have to back up and look. Because here, and this is what we have to deal with, your past does not and will not change your future. We've got to learn to close the door on our past. That's hard. Because I look back and I say, well, listen, you know, I was, I was raised by just a mom. I didn't have a dad in my life. If I would have gone by statistics, Robert, I should have been in jail. I should have been. Because I was one of those lock key kids. You know? I didn't, when I went home, I didn't go home to a parent. I just didn't. Should have been. Uh, always, always, you know, we, we bought the black and white label stuff. You remember that stuff, Mom, right? the, the generic black and white label? They had you had all that stuff. See, now they've changed the labels on it because they don't want us to feel bad. Now it will say Kroger brand or something like that. Back then, it was black and white label. So you had the, you had the, you remember, don't you, Dave? You had the, the, the brand names. You have Ruffle Potato Chips. Beautiful blue, white bag, you know, red writing. Oh, see, I know them, right? And right beside of them, you had a white bag with black writing that said, Rippled Chips. <laughs> what you had. And we felt bad about it. We felt like we were less than. We felt, but you know what? It taught me things. It taught me to be grateful. It taught me to be thankful. Watching my mom dance around the bills laying on the coffee table taught me the faithfulness of God. It taught me how great my God is, how much He cares about my needs. Remember what I told you guys about the macaroni and cheese story? Remember? All these people in our house she had one box of macaroni and cheese. Joe, at my house, every Friday night, the youth were there. There was 30, 40, all up on the hill on Buena Vista. Uh, and we'd always build a bonfire, and everybody's there. And Mother always fed people when they came to the house. You never left our house that you didn't eat. She had one box of macaroni and cheese. She fixed it. She called all of his kids into the kitchen, and she said, pray with me. And she said, God, let this be enough to meet the need. I'll never forget the prayer. Let everybody eat till they're satisfied. And I was like, look at her. This is one box of macaroni and cheese. That's not enough for me. I mean, come on, let's get real for a minute. Everybody ate out of that pot. And we put leftovers in the refrigerator. People can 
say what they want to. I saw it. I was there. Now, I could say, we just never had enough. We never... No. Look at the faithfulness of God that I got to experience. If, I, if my life, if I had been into, born into a rich family, I wouldn't have got to experience that. I wouldn't have seen the faithfulness of God. I wouldn't have the giving spirit that I have now. I wouldn't have those things. So instead of me going, mm -hmm, I'm going to close the door on that past. I'm going to take from it what I need to be the person that I need to be. And now I'm going to make decisions for my future. So I've got to decide where am I in my process. Am I depressed? If you are, that's fine. Admit it. Don't be so super spiritual. No, I'm not depressed. My God. Don't lie to yourself. Because if you don't tell us the truth, you can't get your map. If you're standing in Clarksburg, West Virginia, but you tell the map you're in Fairmont, the directions are not going to be correct. You're going to have a gap that you've got to figure out by yourself. Right? So, let's admit where we are. If you are dissatisfied with where you are, say so. Now, why are you dissatisfied where, where you're at? Do you want a better income? Or are you happy with what you're making? If you're happy with what you're making, God bless you. Keep going. I'm not. So what do I do to change it? Do I focus on getting a raise? No, it's the wrong focus. What do I focus on? They, Dr. Keaton put it this way. He said, they will always pay you one step below where you are. Okay? So if you're an average employee, you're being paid below average salary. If you're a good employee, you're going to get paid average pay. If you are a great employee, you're going to get paid good. But if you are an extraordinary, you're going to get paid great. <coughs> Where do you want to be? If you are happy with below average, then be an average employee. There is nothing wrong with that if that is where you're happy being. It doesn't matter at what level you are. I'm not talking about being CEOs of companies. I'm talking about a bus driver. Okay? This Dave right here is probably one of the, well, I know he is. He's one of the most successful bus drivers we have in the county. How do I know that? Because he's got trophies to prove it. He's got one little nemesis that they kind of go back and forth with a little bit. And, and, but when it comes to the rodeo, you know that you can go in that thing. <laughs> you know, because he'll tell you. You, know, you. you are not going to find anybody that can handle that bus better than he does. Yeah, which. <laughs> Okay? Now, we have some bus drivers that could be good, but they're happy with just showing up to work every day, and if they get from point A to point B and back, it's been a successful day. It's been a successful day. But are you happy with that? Or do you want to be extraordinary? So that if they had to call somebody to fill a spot, would they call you? <clears throat> what, no matter what it is, whether it's working concrete, whether it's working on instruments, you know, why aren't people from Nashville sending instruments to Clarksburg for you to work on? Are you any less talented than the big guys they send them to down there? No. Whenever you touch an instrument, you take an instrument in too, you say, there's nobody that can do a better job on this thing than I can. Now, you have to prove it. How do you prove it? You do that through the day-to-day -day exercise. You study <coughs> what's the newest techniques. You come up with your own techniques. 
Don Hamilton taught me one time I was having a problem with the clarinet. You know, this can really be booger sometimes. And I got the clarinet put all the way back together, and the intonation, which is the tuning of the instrument, just wasn't right. The lower register, I couldn't get it in. And the, the clarinet comes apart in three, four pieces. So it's got four joints on it. It's got the mouthpiece, this joint, this joint, and the bell, right? So he said, Doug, you're not tuning the instrument. I said, what do you mean I'm tuning the instrument? You adjust the mouthpiece and it out to tune the instrument. He said, no, you need to tune each joint. I had no idea. But you know what? I can get you a clarinet that is a perfect pitch. Now, why? Because the wisdom of an 84-year-old man. I learned it. I got it. I also learned that the only good flute is a bit flute. I hate him. <laughs> but you take those wisdom, you take all of that, and I will be an expert in my subject. Whatever your subject happens to be. You guys know that I have some passions in my life. Leadership is a big passion in my life. Music and worship is a big passion in my life. Those are my two biggest passions in the world. So those being my passions, Robert, what is my plan going to look like? My plan should be full of my passions. Because you know what? The prophecies and word of God came over North Central West Virginia that said people will come from around the world to be trained here in the art of worship. And they'll reach out to every part of the world. That was prophesied in 1983. And you know what? It's not happening. You know why? Because I've not studied enough. I haven't put enough work. I haven't become the expert that I need to be. So if God did want to send it here, I'm stopping it. You say, well, that's an awful high opinion. No, it's not. Because you know what was prophesied over me? That I would stand before thousands and teach them to worship. Why is it not happening? Is it God's intention? Yep. So why is it not happening? In between my ears. Thank you for being bold enough to say it. Everybody else is looking at me like, it's the fact. I think wrong. So I had to go back before God and I had to say, God, I don't see myself the way you see me. I don't see myself as that authority in worship. So we're going to change that. Nobody is going to know more about the subject of worship than I do. Nobody's going to know more about the subject than leadership than I do. When somebody has an issue in leadership, you know who they're going to call? They're going to call me. It doesn't matter if it's secular. It doesn't matter if it's the church. If there's a problem at City Hall and they need leadership, understanding, they're not going to call John Maxwell and bring him in from a national voice. They're going to say, we don't need to do that. Doug lives right here. That's going to happen. And it's going to happen in the next five years. Why? Because I'm going to be prepared. Now, what's going to happen in your life? Where are you going to be? What is the call of God? And Rose, this is an age sensitive. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Dominic or if we're talking about you. It doesn't make a difference. Because as long as there's breath, I will praise the Lord, which means I will give him what I have. So, our act. Remember, we always, we always close with an act. How can I apply this? What from today can you take home and apply? And in applying that, what do I need to change? See, there's some things, Robert, in my life that i got to change. There's some habits that I have to change. Okay? Uh, there's some TV shows that I'm not going to get to watch anymore. And thank God for TiVo, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get to do that. And that's okay. That's okay. Smith Wigglesworth said this at one point in time in his life. 
He says, if the conversation is not about God, I don't have time for it. I'm not there yet. I still like to talk about bow hunting. I still like to talk about my guns. I still like to talk about... But he was literally at the point. If you were not talking about things of God, he left the conversation. And he's known as one of the greatest revivalists of history. More people were saved and more ministry started under his ministry than any other. And it became because... If it wasn't talking about God, he wasn't talking. So, what do I need to apply? What do I have to change? And a big one, who can I teach this to? Who can I teach this to? Who do I have influence with that needs to hear this? Because as long as you're pouring yourself out, you're making room for God to pour more in. Pour it out. So God can pour it in. I had a question asked to me. He said, said, Pastor, why are you teaching what you're studying right now? You know, why are you teaching this? You're going through the college classes. I literally went through these classes, this class, over the last week and a half. He said, why are you teaching it? He said, simple. I'm emptying, so I'm ready for this week. Because the things that I'm learning are life-changing to me. Why wouldn't I want to share it? See what I'm saying? So, there's some changes that are happening in my life. There's some things that I'm doing differently. The question is, are you going to be average? Are you going to be good? Are you going to be great? Or are you going to be extraordinary? The choice is yours. Because extraordinary is inside of all of us. It's inside of all of us. The first thing we have to change is we have to change how we think. What do I think about myself? Because when I change how I think, then my emotions will change. When my emotions change, my actions change. When my actions change, my outcomes change. Amen. Amen. Father God, I submit it to you this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I thank you for the changes that you're making in my life. Lord, I just ask that you would help each of us to be willing to make the changes necessary. That, Lord, we could draw a clear picture of who we are, but also who we want to be. And, Lord, we would develop a plan to get there. Lord, I don't want it to be said about me that this young man just failed to plan I really don't want him to say this old man failed to plan. So Lord, help me in my planning. And each one of us as we begin to plan our life and how we're going to strategize and move forward from this point. Give us guidance and direction, Lord. That we would walk in the path that you set for us. With confidence and surety that everything that we need to accomplish the task, you've given to us. You've placed in us. So, Lord, we give it back to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. amen. Woo!